Well, today we're going to focus on uh, these things, and I guess you could consider them basics, but you would not believe the number of questions I get on these three topics, uh, these three parts of uh, taking care of turf, and I thought I would just focus on them. There are a lot of other things, a lot of other nuances, but these are the ones that we think about the most. And the reason that we do that is that there are a lot of uh, bottom line considerations. Um, people wanting um, thick, healthy turf and kind of a medium to green color. Generally, people don't like, like weeds um, and most of them kind of shoot for this moderate level of maintenance. Um, the recreational surfaces are important, especially, boy, you've really noticed that now in this time when uh, we want to um, do more at home. And then as a bonus, uh, turf grass often gets a bad rap for being a high maintenance, um, almost uh, an environmental uh, uh, foe, when just the opposite is true. Uh, turf grass is the best ground cover we have for erosion control, bar, bar none. Um, of course, you get all the other benefits with it too. You get carbon sequestration and noise reduction, oxygen, dust filtering, and all the different things that come with uh, at least a reasonable turf grass. In order to get those benefits, we have um, a number of uh, issues uh, that are, or a number of inputs that are required. Uh, first of all, quality soils. You know, soils are just really important to grow just about anything. And in order to get that, um, uh, you're gonna need to have those in place. Uh, timely fertilizer applications to supplement the soils. Um, uh, a soil moisture potential that is suitable for the turf species being grown, um, minimal competition from weeds and from trees and shrubs, so we recommend the separation thereof, uh, sunlight that is suitable. I so often get questions where people cannot grow turf grass under established trees, and again, another reason to separate. Um, we really need to think about regular mowing. You know, mowing is one of those things where people do it every Sunday regardless, and and nothing in between. Um, and that's just not a good routine to get on. And then of course, lots of things around insect disease control. And we can talk about that in future presentations. But quite often the, the question is, well, why should I fertilize? If I fertilize more uh, or fertilize at all, I'll just have to mow more. And again, the answer is quality. We want uh, color and, and shoot density. We want a, a decent turf. And without uh, fertilization, we're not going to get lateral spread. And we won't get recovery from traffic or environmental stresses. And then also, uh, if you're on a clipping uh, removal, if you bag your clippings, um, you are going to need to fertilize to replace those nutrients. When you return the clippings, you don't need to fertilize as nearly as much. Um, now, in eastern Nebraska and western Iowa, growth is controlled by the most limiting nutrient. Well, growth is always controlled by the most limiting nutrient, but in Eastern Nebraska and Western Iowa, that's gonna be nitrogen. Um, there are lots of different forms in which you can apply your nitrogen. Uh, there are quick release forms and slow release forms. And you certainly heard, heard the old adage of getting what you pay for. Um, and that is the case that the slow release forms are better to use, but they cost more. Um, the quick release forms of urea and ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, have a greater potential to burn the turf, and they also don't last as long. Um, the slow release materials um, are less burning and last longer. Um, therefore, most manufacturers will give you a mixture of the two, um, but you really shouldn't be afraid of either one or using either one by itself. It's just a matter of how much you put on and uh, how long you expect it to last. Um, the cost is again low for water soluble or fast release fertilizers and high um, for water insoluble or slow release materials. And therefore, uh, you put them on more frequently with fast materials and more slowly or, or less often for the slow release materials. And they all have sources, they are all sometimes beneficial. If we're looking at kind of an acceptable range here, uh, the quick release materials, uh, you get a fast response out of the application, but it doesn't last very long, as you can see here. So if you're just using fast release materials, you need to put them on over a period of time and maybe more applications than one 
more slow release material that's going to have a slower initial response but lasts a lot longer. So again, the fast and slow sources. Um, we encourage people to do this according to the local conditions. If you have a nice steady growth uh, already, already green, then you don't need as much or as often. And it really just depends on the desire that you have for growth and, and cover. Um, and I already mentioned the, uh, the blending of the turf, the blending of the products based on your need. A lot of it depends on what I call landscape age. And this depends on really if you live in kind of the older, more established parts of town near the courthouse, um, or if you're in a newer subdevelopment. And, and I'll kind of explain that a little bit as we go along. Um, really, uh, <clears throat> it, timing is everything, just as in playing the stock market. Timing is everything, and if you need a nice summary of that, you can go to this website that explains it. But <clears throat> a lot of us have been uh, sort of pre-programmed to follow a holiday schedule or a four-step schedule or a six-step schedule, um, which uh, generally uh, is, is convenient and easy to remember, but probably not the best thing for your lawn. The second problem with that is these products that you see in a five-step program are highly linked to pest control, especially a pre-emergence herbicide or a grub control. You get two for the price of one, which is uh, manu manufacturer's um, error in that you often are wanting to put on one product but not the other, and they're giving you a product or selling you a product that has both. So they're sort of forcing an application that you don't necessarily want. Um, Looking, and I'm gonna show a graph of this, but each of these time frames are um, good or better times to apply it. Um, in late April and early May, or even mid-April, depending on you know, what part of the, the Midwest you're in, you're a couple hours north, so it'd be more uh, towards the late April. If you look out at the average lawn that has been around for 20 years or so, usually the turf is growing pretty well. And the reason for that is, uh, it's just the natural order of things. Uh, there's something called nitrogen mineralization and micronutrient release. Just the way Mother Nature has made the world, there's a the microorganism population in the world um, uh, releases at that time. Uh, and that releases nutrients and minerals. Uh, and the minerals in the soil release uh, just because of that as the soils begin to warm. So really not a lot of need for fertilization at that point. Um, once this, start, once this natural fertilizer in the ground starts to slow down, um, then it becomes more important. So in late May or early June becomes a good time to fertilize when that spring surge has slowed down. And the same thing is true in late summer. Uh, again, recovering from summer stress is a good time to add nutrients. The following time or the last time would be late October or early November, just very lightly as we head into winter. Here's a good example of what I was talking about with the natural release of nitrogen fertilizer in the soil uh, in the early spring. This is a park uh, that has never been fertilized. And you can see, gee, that's pretty nice looking grass. All, all it has been done is to it is mow it. Um, so why would you fertilize that? If you fertilize that, a turf that has good density, good color, good natural pest resistance, it's just gonna increase the need for mowing. So there's really no need at this point. Now, once that spring growth slows down, then yes, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and add it. And here I have this handy chart for you. Um, you're looking at that time of year of putting on, if you're gonna fertilize, you would put on just a, a light amount, maybe a fourth of a rate, a fourth of what's called for on the label. Typically, you're gonna get a manufacturer's recommendation for a certain number of pounds of the product, and that will deliver one pound of actual nitrogen. So it might be 15 pounds of that fertilizer bag, or uh, a certain amount that will fertilize a 5,000 square foot bag. And I'll explain that later as well. And then again, here's this application after the spring slowdown. Um, so a little bit more, so probably in that three fourths of a pound label. Um, and then the same amount for late summer to help recover from summer stress. And then heading into winter, a little bit of fast release fertilizer to help you uh, put down a few root, roots and give, enhance any kind of winter potential or winter protection. So there's kind of your basic uh, four-step program and there's a lot of uh, flexibility and it's set up depending on local conditions 
and what you observe the grass to be doing. If, it, if it's nice and thick and green, you don't really need fertilization at that point. Um, now I have a, an attorney in my, my family, so um, the answer commonly when I ask my daughter a question is, well, it depends. So if I ask her, what about, <coughs> what are the legal ramifications on this? She'll say, well, it depends on the court, it depends on the precedent, it depends on the judge, it depends on what the jury is told before they go out for deliberations, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing is true in terms of um, turf grass maintenance. You have to think about what causes thin turf. Uh, are we talking about shade or bad soils or some sort of pest control or, a, you know, a lot of times between uh, when properties change hands. So between moving from one owner to the next, there's a lack of turf grass maintenance. Then again, it's your expectation as a homeowner. Are you expecting something lush like a bank landscape, a bank lawn, or just something kind of green or something in between? Uh, generally, most of our recommendations are, are encouraged or kind of set towards that in between. That way you're, you can adjust upper and, and lower. Then again, back to that courthouse situation, if you're in an older part of town, um, if you're in a, an, a, what I mean by older is say 40 years old or older, um, those lawns need less fertilizer in general. And because the reason for that is there's been a lot of, usually a lot of debris that's fallen on the lawn, gotten chewed up by the lawnmower, and has kind of filtered its way down into the turf. <coughs> um, it's been a longer time since the turf was disturbed. Therefore, the soil has had a chance to kind of build back up again. You know, look, newer lawns generally need more fertilizer because the soil has been disturbed more recently and we're dealing mostly with subsoil. We're not getting those natural um, those natural uh, benefits that you would get from more humus in the soil. So it just kind of depends. <laughs> then is, so another thing that I always talk about is managing someone's expectations. And this is probably true most often in terms of um, someone who has seen a really desirable lawn and wants it. It can easily take three years of following good management practices to meet those expectations. So it, it's, it's not something like you put, uh, you know, a turkey dinner in the microwave um, where you hit the five and later you pull it out. That's, that's a reasonable expectation for a microwave, but not for taking care of a lawn. All right, now we shift over to some of the things that I promised you I would talk about. I really don't like that when speaker says, I'm going to bring it up and then they'll get to that later. Well, this is later. This is, this is one of those things where we talk about it. I mentioned the appropriate needs for uh, a turf grass setting. The first one we think about is this right plant, right place phrase. And I'm sure you've probably heard that from other presenters. But sunlight and lack of uh, root competition are, are major issues. This isn't so much a turf grass management issue as it is a landscape design issue. So instead of separating turf and trees, we have them co-located in a situation and so we have a lot of problems that the trees are putting on the turf here. The tree is casting a lot of shade and sucking a lot of water and nutrients out of the turf, and so therefore the turf struggles as a result. As opposed to this situation, where we have a, a, a designed separation of the turf and ornamentals, and each one can be watered differently, each one can be fertilized differently, each one can be cared for according to its own needs. Same thing type of thing here. So instead of trying to grow turf grass in the shade, uh, we're growing some uh, perennial ground covers and some annuals mixed in for color, uh, and it's much more appropriate. The soil has a huge influence on the performance of turf. Uh, in this situation, there uh, you're looking at that and thinking, oh my gosh, why, why do we have this sort of L-shaped uh, problem? Uh, it's almost like a peninsula or like the state, if you, if you turn your head to the side, it almost looks like Florida. This, this green area, this light green area. Well, what happened is, um, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you notice that this bad looking turf is adjacent to a street. Um, and oh, probably three months before this, there was some street repairs, rather extensive street repairs being done in this area and they disturbed the soil. And in fact, they ripped off all the good soil, hauled it off somewhere else and brought back some crummy, high, heavy clay, high pH soil 
and replaced it. And at first it looked somewhat reasonable and um, it took some soil testing and some uh, probing of the soil to figure out really what was wrong here. Uh, it's the same exact turf grass, but it's grown on bad soil. And, and that's a pretty stark uh, issue. So soil problems are hard to figure out because they're multi-component, they're complicated. First of all, they're hidden. The soil is hidden, unlike shoots that you can actually look at. Um, and they're poor for many reasons. Uh, first of all, a lot of times you're looking at volume, uh, especially if you're growing trees and shrubs, there's just not enough volume or surface rooting space. Uh, more commonly, what we're thinking about here is in terms of adequate drainage. Uh, when you're in a real heavy clay soil, the water does not have a chance to get out and, and move laterally. And then you, the other issue is uh, this age of the soil I was talking about before. Um, where you have uh, a lot of clay or a lot of or heavy sand, one or the other, you don't have that happy medium in between. So you don't have the capacity for roots to expand, uh, for to absorb nutrients, nutrients to absorb water or get rid of excess water. So you're you're not in that that sweet spot that you're looking for. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure the pH and the cation exchange capacity. And all of those issues are in a in a good situation, uh, and and a lot of times they're not, and so that's why you're dealing with soil problems. Digging down a little deeper, uh, the sand, the silt, and the clay um, are problematic from a, a real uh, standpoint of, of being much different than the average uh, the average bear. <clears throat> you know the the difference between as you pull these nutrients apart. Sands are much bigger and much coarser than silts and clay. And so we have three different sands being illustrated here, a fine, a medium, and a coarse. And then the red dot is silt, which is much smaller than, than even the smallest sand. And then if you see the word clay on this illustration, and there's a, if you look at it closely, there is a little dot next to it. And that, that is a clay particle. So that shows you the relative size of these and the, and the clays because of their size and their structure are easily compacted and, and easily uh, the point where you don't have the potential for drainage or, or oxygen exchange in the clays. Um, now if you were trying to make silly putty or if you're trying to make bricks or uh, compact a roadbed you want clay. <clears throat> if you're trying to grow plants you don't want that. Um, what we're looking for is something in the upper left hand corner um, or the lower left-hand corner where we get some, some actual aggregation, some actual water space, some air space between the soil particles. And we're trying to avoid the lower right-hand corner where they're gonna get poor oxygen and poor water movement. And then here you see it illustrated just a little bit different way. So on the two left-hand sides, even the, all of the sides on the left except the one on the right, we're, we're dealing with better oxygen and water uh, infiltration and better root development overall. Here's just another way to look at it and to illustrate it. On the left, we want to see about half of it, half the soil being mineral, uh, maybe of that 5% being organic matter. And then the other half, we want it to be airspace. Now, many times air spaces are full of water, but as long as they can drain away, then that's, that's a good thing. Um, this is an illustration of an actual reconstruction of soil layers that I ran across um, in California one time and I just thought it was great because <clears throat> what you can see on the left and the right are disturbed soils and natural soils and and it's just another way to look at this. If you get a chance and your friend or you are building a home you can see it go through various stages of uh, destruction by the soil movers and what you're really looking for there is an opportunity to, to, to correct that. So if you're building a new home, um, you have a budget in your curtains and carpet, what you should really do is cut that in half and spend half of it on rebuilding the soil. Uh, because, you know, in these kinds of settings, you're just really, you're asking for trouble if you don't have any chance to have soil drainage and, um, and nutrients. Um, in this situation, what you'll end up with is this many times, where you'll have this um, thin little layer being brought back in in some of the beds perhaps, put on top of heavy clay and nowhere for that water to move out. In fact, you end up with many times a perched water table. And you see that illustrated here where water is being dripped into a, um, 
a profile and the water will move out and just the physics of, of gravity will indicate that you get water to move through a well-drained soil when it hits that compacted layer it just stops and starts to move sideways and it will only water will only drain downward once the upper layer is completely saturated so this is why you have really bad soils in many of these new construction areas because you don't have the the drainage the adequate drainage and so really all it takes is spending a little time and money on getting that back and here you see both the turf and the landscape planting just really suffering because of poorly drained soils. Um, we get compaction and other, uh, we get pack, compaction on soils that weren't all that bad to begin with just from other construction. You can see <clears throat> a new patio being installed in this space. And of course, all the, all the, uh, the new concrete and all the other construction that went on drove right across this little space here repeatedly. And if it was wet, it was made a lot worse. Uh, a lot more compaction occurred. So, you know, whatever was growing there uh, is no longer growing there. <clears throat> so there are a number of ways to try to address poor soils for the betterment of turf and trees. Um, one is just a, a ripping. And this is a photo I got from um, one of the foresters. And we're just sim simply loosening the soil uh, in order to kind of break apart that clay. Now, ideally, what you then would do then is put in uh, some compost to fill in those voids and recreate what Mother Nature provided before um, the house was built. Uh, there's another procedure. Uh, this is from Cornell University. And this, this method is just simply called scoop and dump. And literally, with a backhoe or some sort of device, you just lift up the existing material after the house is built or in any area that's problematic and drop it down again. So lift it up and drop it down again. Now, there's always different ways to do this. Um, in this slide we saw earlier, what happens is you rip through it um, and then work compost in. Here's where you put compost on the top and lift the whole mess up and drop it. Um, each one has pros and cons, and you kind of use whatever you have to your best ability, but um, it's, it's something to think about. Now, this is kind of pre-doing it where they're gonna do scoop and dump, but first of all, they put compost on and then spread it out and then come in and do the, the scooping and dumping. Um, you, here, here's an illustration of what happened here uh, of this procedure being done. Um, so you got a, a relatively new landscape. Um, this particular place is six years old or so, and you can just see after this new renovated patio was put in, kind of a fire pit patio kind of option there for these homeowners. Um, just tore the, it just ripped up and destroyed all the, the ground around it. And again, here you see this heavy clay that's been brought up because it's a relatively new home and no compost or reconstruction of the soil was done afterwards. Um, so instead of a, a, a ripping it or using a, um, a lift and dump or a scoop and dump method, really just coming in with a pickaxe or a, a pitchfork is really gonna do the same kind of thing for you. And um, this works pretty well. Uh, pulling it into pieces, letting it set and mellow for a while, putting about an inch of compost on the whole area, um, doing a little bit of raking to smooth it out. And uh, this is that same area a few months later. So it went from this to this in just a couple of months. And the only reason why this has got a little bit of a problem in it is because that's a high traffic area where people Patio. So you can see it from the same area from a different perspective now. Um, you see the area on the upper left being really stressed and the area in front of the um, uh, access off the patio doing really well. Um, on the opposite side of the patio, there are three distinct areas have developed uh, and I find them very instructive. On the lower left, what you see are the existing conditions before any kind of uh, soil um, improvements have been done. Thin, stressed, um, uh, soon to be weed infested turf. And then <clears throat> on the upper left is that healthy turf that's been improved with a little bit of loosening of the soil and then um, some um, compost addition, a little bit of pitchforking of that material, um, and then it looks good. And on the right, it's interesting because <clears throat> the same thing happened on the right. Um, except the turf was simply not cared for with a medium amount of maintenance. Um, 
just wasn't water. The watering was done just to keep it slightly moist on the upper left and wasn't done on the right. So even if you go to the trouble of enhancing the soil or rebuilding the soil, it's still not gonna give you complete. Now, if you're not willing to go to all that work, the kind of slow, steady approach that's gonna yield results that are positive, but over a much slower length of time is core aerification. And the reason that this works <clears throat> is that um, you're, you're doing what the other uh, three methods have talked about, but um, on a you know, much less square footage or surface area standpoint. So this disturbs about one-tenth of the area that the previous three did, but it also doesn't cause a lot of disruption to the turf. Now, what you can do afterwards kind of varies on your individual situation. One of the things I like to see people do is, is uh, chew up all these cores and then mix in a little compost across the top, drag on uh, the top and work that into the holes that are left but after the aerification. Um, or you could remove all the cores and uh, put on a thin layer of compost and then you get a, a faster result. Or you could simply just chew up all the cores with a, with a, uh, with a lawnmower and work it down. So it just depends on how fast the results and how much labor you want to go to, but um, that's kind of an individual situation. Now, another thing about turf that will affect and be affected by having the water move through it in terms of uh, irrigation potential is what's called thatch. Now, people have kind of misconceptions about thatch. Um, the biggest one is that returning the clippings or, or uh, putting the clippings back on the lawn will help to uh, speed up the thatch accumulation on the lawn. And that's simply not true. Uh, thatch comes from um, the breakdown of very hard parts of the turf grass plant. And uh, everything between the knife blade tip and the lower parts of the turf grass plants there are thatch. Kind of halfway in the middle of the thatch, you can see some little white flecks. And what those are are roots that have been cut off. Each of those roots has a covering over the top of it called a sheath, uh, like a knife sheath. And those materials are very hard, of course, they're a knife sheath. And they're intended to protect the, the roots as they spread laterally in the ground and the rhizomes as they spread laterally in the ground. And so they have to be hard and tough and resist breakdown. Well, once they build up uh, and as they build up over time, it will, uh, it will build up this thatch. <coughs> And just like a thatch roof in Europe, uh, they resist, they have increased runoff. So once in a while, you got to go in and rip it out. If you do that, it's pretty injurious. I mean, it rips out some really good plants too. And so uh, hopefully you don't have to do that very often. If you do, you would want to do it at a time of year when the, when the grass is able to grow back. So if you have a tall fescue or a Kentucky bluegrass lawn or a ryegrass lawn, you'd want to do it uh, late April, early May, or the best time of the year to do it is early September when you've got three months worth of good growing conditions after um, the damage that you're going to do to the lawn. Uh, overall, it's better to get about at least half of this thatch out. You don't want to get it all out. You want about half of it out in order to have it work. So aeration is, is either, either the core cultivation, the aerating, or the, uh, the, the power raking. Um, you're going to get much better water infiltration and less compaction. Most of the compaction occurs in the upper two inches of soil when you're dealing with a lawn. And so when you're doing this aerification, if you can get three inch cores coming out, that's going to make a big difference. And so doing these core cultivation and power raking in the, uh, in the times that is conducive to grow back and the time for sufficient time for recovery is going to work out really well. Now, if you're dealing with um, a warm season turf like zoysia grass or buffalo grass, that would be done, again, under the same guidelines when you have sufficient time for recovery, um, which would be early summer. So let me remind you again of the fertilizer application and timing rate. Um, that's kind of this early uh, season if you need it, which most of the time you don't. Uh, early summer, late summer, around Halloween. We'll get you through. Now in order to, uh, to know how much to put on, okay, so since we're not putting on a pound at each one of these application times, which is what the label calls for, 
you're going to need to know how much to put on. Fortunately, it's pretty easy. Um, it's, not, it's not very difficult. So the goal is to calculate how much of the fertilizer product, how many pounds in the bag that you put on. And it's really just math. It's nothing complicated. Um, you just simply divide the amount you want. So here we go back. So if you want half a pound, you divide that amount um, by the analysis. We're just gonna look at nitrogen. So you divide 0 0.5 by 0 0.21. And that will tell you that you want about two and a half pounds of that fertilizer product for every square th every thousand square foot uh, unit that you have in your lawn. And most people have five. So here you see it again. Now this is with a slightly more concentrated fertilizer product. So this one, oops, this one was basically 20% nitrogen. This one is about a 30% nitrogen. So when you have a more concentrated fertilizer product, you're going to put on less. So in this case, we want to put on about two and a half, this one, one and a half, or one and three quarters. So just less fertilizer. So it's pretty simple and pretty easy to figure out. Um, so if you only had a thousand square feet, you're done. If you put on uh, one and three quarters or two pounds of fertilizer product, you're done. You don't need to do anything else. But most of us have more than a thousand square foot area. So then you need to calculate square feet. So you break it up into geometric, uh, geometric uh, uh, shapes. <laughs> I'm struggling for the word, sorry, shapes. Rectangles and squares are the easiest because it's just length times width. Um, but if you've got a triangle or a, a circle shaped area, then there you got the formulas there too. Circles of the pi r squared. There's an old joke about a gentleman from Louisiana with pi r squared that I won't take the time to tell now, <clears throat> or a triangle, which is half times the base times the height, pretty easy to figure out. Here's an example. If you've got the radius being nine, uh, then you multiply 3.14 times nine pi is nine, you end up with 250 square feet. It's pretty straightforward. If you have a uh, height and a base of 12 and 10, then you multiply 0 0.5 times N times 12 and you end up with just 60 square feet. So pretty small area. Uh, let's say you have a 25 by 10 area that's a rectangle, then you end up with 250 square feet, about the size of the circle. <clears throat> and then you may want to just add these things together. So you've got say three turf areas, one's 60 by 30, one's a circle 40 foot across, and you've got a triangle. You add these up, work the math, and you end up with um, just shy of 5,000 square feet um, for your overall area. And then <clears throat> you end up with how many thousand square feet units. You determine the number of thousand square foot units by dividing that area by a thousand. So uh, in this case, you ended up with uh, 4,256 divided by a thousand. That gives you 4.2 1,000 square foot units. And you multiply that number by the amount required for each 1,000. That's pretty straightforward. So you end up with 7.2 pounds required to put on a half a pound of nitrogen at that rate. Um, you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, this, this bag is 15 pounds. So if you put the full bag on, you're going to put on twice as much as you had intended, which is not what you want to do. So if you're going to put on, at this time of year, a half a pound of nitrogen, you don't want to put the full bag on. You want to put on half of the bag or a third of the bag, whatever you calculate. You can use this for any fertilizer product, uh, which is really nice because a lot of times you don't have the spreader settings that they call for. One last thing on fertilizer, the fertilizer is for the grass, not for the sidewalk or the street. So this is where you want your high-powered blower just to pick it up and move it back to the grass. Let's move on to water now. Um, looking at uh, soggy soils, if you've got a clay, uh, drier soils, if you've got a sand, you don't want either one of these extremes. You want just right in the middle. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking for. Uh, it's just right in the middle there. Um, and the way to tell that is by using this high-tech instrument called a screwdriver. Uh, you stick it in the, in the ground, you look at it and you see, well, is this moist or is it, is it soggy or is it dry? This is what you call moist. Um, just where it is cool and, and slightly damp to the touch. 
where it sticks to the blade of the screwdriver, doesn't fall off like if it was powdery dry, and doesn't drip if it's drip water droplets off of it if it was wet. You're looking for a happy medium here. You're looking for moist, not soggy, and not dry. Now there are lots of uh, pieces of equipment to help you get deliver it. Um, the first one's a pop-up sprayer. There are geared rotors. There are stream rotors. There are drip systems. There's the rain train, and then there's the awful um, uh, oscillating sprinkler that waters the air more than it waters the turf. But of course, all of these devices have uh, problems. And here's one where this impacts uh, head is hitting the grass at an uneven level. And so the close up turf to the head is just sort of uh, spattering or uh, intercepting it. We're not getting good uniform coverage. Here's a situation that we see de develop quite often if uh, properties uh, set for a little while between owners is where the trees kind of overgrow uh, the top of the uh, heads. Um, on the right <coughs> side, we see the same kind of thing as a, who put in that fence in the middle of my sprinkler pattern. Uh, so we want to be able to have a uh, good coverage. Quite often when turf is neglected, you can see the turf grass itself grow across the top of the heads. And then again, there are just sometimes when you have poorly installed heads, we don't need to be watering this area. Uh, with a high powered water stream that's so strong it knocks over the mailbox. So you don't need that. <clears throat> and then sometimes we have heads that don't close. They don't come back down. The pressure isn't adequate for it to come back down or it's just simply old. And then someone runs it off and, and hits it with a lawnmower. And then this is what you end up with. Or on the right, you end up with problems where the, there's a head and it's watering well, but it doesn't cover the entire area. So the, the irrigation design was poor. In order to do that, we want to run an audit. Now, it's not the kind of audit like where you have someone look at your bank records, like an IRS audit. Um, it's just how much water is being put on and how evenly is it being put on. And you can see different illustrations of how you run an irrigation audit. Now, you can use a highly specific, well-designed, um, graduated cylinder approach like you would if you were going to audit a baseball field. Or you can use tuna cans. And um, although I detest tuna, um, I like the cans after my, the rest of my family members have eaten it um, because I can uh, save them and then use it to test uh, turf grass settings for uniformity of the irrigation. Overall, though, we're looking at the depth of the roots and the uniformity of the application, how well the infiltration happens. We're interested in uh, watering in the early morning because we have less wind distortion, less evaporation, uh, less diseases. Um, and then also we're thinking back to landscape design. Um, trees, turf, flowers, ground covers, if they all sharing the same root zone, which they are, whatever you do to one, you do to all. And that's something you want to just be careful of. That's why we encourage people to separate trees and turf so that you can water turf separately than you water flowers. Um, but overall, we want to end up keeping the roots moist. We want to water to the bottom of the roots plus a half an inch to an inch more because more is lost and less is not enough for the full depth of the root. So here are some key take home messages. If you don't get anything else out of this, you want to make sure that you understand these things. So first of all, keep the ro roots moist, not soggy or dry. Again, we use a screwdriver to be able to help us with that. Um, we water to the bottom of the roots because that's the whole thing you want to keep moist. It's like in a house plant. You water the whole pot, and so you see water draining out the bottom of the pot. You know you've, you've watered all the roots. Um, and just think about it. In all seasons, there's just sort of a natural tendency ne to neglect turf. In the spring, we're all excited about our flowers. In the fall, or in the middle of the summer, we're picking fruit. In the, in the fall, we're looking at the pretty fall perennials that have great fall color and the shrubs that have great fall color. So <clears throat> there's a tendency in just about any time of the year to neglect turf. So try to fight against that. And then I don't want to burst your bubble, but all irrigation systems are broken. It's just a matter of how badly they're broken. They're mechanical devices. They break down. Uh, stuff happens. And so they, every time you irrigate, whether it's one you hook up to the hose spigot or it's one that you push the button to start, just realize it's broken and it could be fixed. So to encounter that, or to counteract that rather, 
what we encourage people to do is uh, to use this. This is uh, my irrigation controller. Uh, I had a, a company install it, and I said, I want your cheapest, most easiest, basic uh, system. And they said, well, that would be the Hunter x -Core. And I said, okay, great. I'm not advocating for any one specific, Well, there are lots of good irrigation controllers. Rainbird makes some, Nelson makes some, Hunter makes some. Um, but what we encourage people to do is run it in the system off mode. Um, not any of these other things, these, all these other things are great, but the basic concept you gotta get across is run it as needed. So the way to do it is keep your system in off, not in automatic, because that way you can water according to the plant's needs, according to the turf's needs, rather than some predetermined schedule that might or might not be helpful. Uh, especially if you're out of town, my gosh. Uh, you don't know, if you're out of town to Branson for two weeks and it rains every day while you're gone, you cer certainly don't want your irrigation system running. Um, and maybe you could have someone who's babysitting your cats, you could teach them how to use it, but um, you, the best system is off. Um, so that you know that you're not putting on water when you don't need to. This is what I'm talking about with uh, watering to the bottom of the roots. And you can see that in the spring and in the fall, we have deeper roots uh, if you're growing bluegrass and tall fescue. Uh, if you're growing uh, buffalo grass or zoysia, it's just the opposite. It's the exact opposite what I have illustrated here. So what you're going to do is use deeper, infrequent applications in the spring and fall, probably twice a week for a half an inch each time so you deliver an inch of water and then lighter more frequent irrigation in the middle of the summer uh, maybe a quarter of an inch four times a week I mean these, these are just guesstimates you're using that screwdriver to really tell you how often and how much to water here's that screwdriver friend again and that's going to help us know how much water to put down and when to do it all right shifting to our last part is uh, weed control and this is somewhat seasonal as well uh, because of the predominance of annual weeds in the lawn, um, we know that generally in new lawns, applying a pre-emergence herbicide is kind of a given. Now in somewhat mature, say 30 year old lawns and beyond, if you've been a good turf grass manager, you probably don't need to apply it, a pre-emergence herbicide. But you know, typically in late April is about the time when we recommend that you pay attention to soil temperature, and I watched it very closely. We installed a, uh, uh, two or three years ago, we installed a, uh, what's it called, a weather station at our office. And the master gardeners monitor that. And they do a great job. And it's really a great project. It's fun for them. And it's fun for me. And it gives out good information to our clients. So um, that works out really well. And this year, right on target, actually, as it moved right into May, the soil temperature was in kind of that target zone of 55 degrees for a couple of days in a row, and it worked out pretty well. Here are some of the products you might use uh, or a commercial company that you hire might use. Pendimethalin, prodiamine, isoxabin, dithiapyr. These are great products. They work really well. There are pros and cons of each. There's a, uh, a material that came out, oh, 20-ish years ago called corn gluten meal, it's kind of a natural byproduct of the corn milling industry, that was purported to have um, pre-emergence herbicide uh, properties. As it turns out, it's kind of a question mark whether it really does or doesn't. Its best pre-emergence herbicide is the fact that it's a fertilizer. And by having a thicker turf, it naturally resists uh, weed invasion. So, eh. It, it might work, it might not. The current thinking is it really doesn't do much in the way of pre-emergence herbicide. It's a good fertilizer. It works out pretty well for that, but it's not all that helpful. Um, watering these products down to the root zone, that upper half inch to two inches is where most of those uh, weeds are. So you want to get it off the grass blades down to the root. Um, thin lawns might really benefit from what we call kind of a split app uh, application half the rate applied in late April, half the rate in early June. But keep in mind that most, almost all products will contain fertilizer and herbicide. So that's another reason why you put on, put on a half rate so you don't put on a full slug of fertilizer um, in uh, uh, late April when you don't really need to. Uh, now we've already started to see some uh, uh, pre or some German, uh, germination rather, 
of uh, yellow nut sedge. Um, but it, it comes on usually kind of mid to late uh, May and really, uh, oh my gosh, it's such a hard one to control. Uh, it spreads by uh, little nutlets in the ground and it just, it, it's really problematic. And a lot of people have different names for this. You might hear them call it water grass or a number of four letter words for it. Um, but it can be controlled. There's been a numerous amounts of very quality high, uh, you know, very good scientific studies done at our university for its control, starting with uh, sort of its biology and moving on to different nature. It's very complicated. Um, there are a couple of products that work reasonably well for its control, halosulfuron and sulfentrazone, uh, and spot spraying it, not treating the whole lawn, but just the spots of it. It's probably a three year type of thing where you're gonna apply it, realize you get some reduction, maybe apply it again a couple, three weeks later, apply it again, come back and trying to keep reducing it with application several years in a row. Again, managing expectations uh, is, is important when it comes to that. In late September and into October is when we really think about controlling broadleaves, uh, broadleaf weeds. Um, it's the preferred timing because um, that's when the translocation is high or the movement of the herbicide down to the roots is high. Um, also, many vegetable gardens and annual plantings are kind of winding down. Um, applications of any spot spray of any herbicide made at that point will control the the weeds, but won't burn the turf. Number of different pro number of different products. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of different. You know, Trimax, Speed Zone, Square One, Power Zone, Weed Be Gone Max. There's a variety of different products that you can you can choose. And then there's of course there's always the uh, the thing that we try to encourage people or or educate them on is spot spraying uh, versus the weed and feed or broadcast applications. Typically don't like the weed and feed applications because they put, fertilize, they put fertilizer and herbicide everywhere. Um, so many, most of the time, you, unless you're buying a, <laughs> a neglected, never cared for, total weed kind of turf, um, you don't have weeds everywhere. So why would you put herbicide everywhere? You really shouldn't. Um, you, should, you should only do it from the standpoint of uh, where the weeds actually are. So that's why you see what is illustrated in the right being a good application of a spot spraying, just killing the weeds where they are. All right, I think that's, that's my last slide. So um, I think I will back out of this and ask if there are any questions. Yes, I want to talk about yeah, let's have some questions. Let me okay, I, all right. Um, the first question is proper mowing length or height of the grass. Okay. Uh, you know, it depends on the grass type. So if you have uh, Kentucky bluegrass, you know, typically say two and a half to three inches is what we would recommend. If you have tall fescue, generally about three inches to three and a half inches. If you have zoysia grass, usually about two inches. Uh, and buffalo grass can be maintained anywhere between say two and a half and six inches. So it, it kind of depends a lot on which grass you have. Go ahead and ask your questions in the chat. We do have one more. What okay, is the, go ahead. What is the best way to treat dandelions that have become invasive in our newly acquired house. Yeah. Well, if you have dandelions everywhere, or, or, you know, this is where I would recommend a, a broadcast application, a weed and feed type of approach. Um, the, the caveat is um, that you need the herbicide to stay in contact with the weed. This is a limitation of a weed and feed product. All the while, the lawn also, or the turf grass blades also have them in contact with it, and there's a little bit of a potential for burning. So if it's everywhere, you would either want to do the spot spraying everywhere or do the broad broadcast weed and feed everywhere, realizing you may get a little bit of burn 
out of the fertilizer and herbicide combination. Typically though, that's kind of temporary, probably a week to two weeks. So that would be the only uh, scenario where I would recommend a, a weed and feed. We have another question about getting creeping Charlie out of a lawn. Right, uh, the first thing is to manage expectations, kind of like uh, with the nut sedge. Creeping Charlie is actually a, uh, an escaped ground cover. And so at one point, someone was selling it as a ground cover plant in a garden center. Um, and does a really nice job of covering the ground. Um, this is a broadleaf weed that is best controlled uh, through liquid applications of any of the products shown there. So Trimax, Speed Zone, Power Zone, Square One, We Be Gone Max. Um, right. Is there a certain time of year that works better? Oh, thank you for that follow-up question. You can burn it back now um, at this point, but you would expect at this point, uh, if you mix it up according to the label directions and applied it, um, uh, with water and the proper amount of, of herbicide to water and wet the leaves thoroughly, um, you could expect about a 40 to 50 percent reduction um, in, the, in the density of the Creeping Charlie or Ground Ivy. If you did it in uh, late September, early October, that percentage of reduction would go up you'd probably be looking at about a 60 to 70% reduction. Um, so again, it's about expectations. Do it, you can control it now, and, but you'll control it much more completely in the fall. What we would encourage you against doing is, is a little bit of information can be dangerous because human nature is, well, if a little bit is good, then a lot is better. And so knowing, you know, in your mind, if you know, hey, it's not gonna work as good as I want it to, I'll just put more in. So if it calls for an ounce and a half per gallon, I'll put in two and a half ounces per gallon, and then I'll get the results I want. So we would highly encourage you against doing that. Use the recommended around, amount, apply it once now, and then be patient and come back in the fall and do it again in early uh, October or late September. Can you also touch on if you've got a bare spot and seeding that bare spot in? Yes. So seeding this bare spot in is going to be best if you use a pitchfork and loosen the soil as was illustrated by uh, the fellow who was using um, the pickaxe. So it needs to be a loosening of the soil. Uh, in order for those new uh, grass seedlings to get uh, established, um, that's important. In order to get those new seedlings established, you really need to have the soil uh, be a, a good enough or loose enough to have the seedlings, the, root, the roots of the new plants penetrate it and spread laterally. Um, that is something that uh, we would really encourage. Otherwise, you think about planting uh, radishes or lettuce, right? If you ever have that uh, opportunity, then you know what I'm talking about or have had that opportunity. If you have not loosened the soil, you put the, the radish seeds or the lettuce seeds or the carrot seeds um, out, you know, if you then, you, uh, you know, it's just going to work a lot better with a loosened soil. I don't know how else to describe it. If you have seeded into a hard soil, I think that's where I was going, then you have had a failure of those vegetables. Um, anything you seed, you know, is, is that, so anything, anytime you put any kind of seed in the ground, you need to loosen the soil. And what I would encourage is a pitchfork, a four-pronged, stiff tying pitchfork. You put that in the ground, you lift it. You put it in the ground, you twist it. All right. Does that answer your question? It does. John, I, we don't have any other questions in the chat right now, but would you talk a little bit about um, Backyard Farmer and how people can watch that? Oh, okay. Well, it's a show on Nebraska Public Television on Thursday nights. And it, um, it is a show that is a, a web stream. And it's also um, 
posted online right after it's been aired. What I encourage people to do is go to that website. Just go to the Backyard Farmer website. So if you can get that on your local PBS NET channel, that's great. Um, if you can't, there are a lot of really good YouTube videos that Backyard Farmer has. Um, a number of uh, my colleagues are regular participants in uh, Backyard Farmer. Um, I used to be the host of Backyard Farmer, uh, but then things changed and uh, I'm not anymore. Sometimes we still do the videos. My colleague and I uh, do some videos that uh, Kim will drop in. Um, and so it's just a great show and it's a great effort. Um, overall. Yeah. Thank you. We have a lot of people that are from Iowa that are listening to us today. And so I thought they would be interested in knowing a little bit about what Nebraska has to offer. So checking out that website would be a great thing. Backyard Farmer. Is it backyardfarmer.unl.edu? No, it's just, B, just byf.unl.edu. Okay, great. For those Thank of you, you so who much. haven't watched the show, I'm sorry. I, it, it, what it is, is um, there's a host and there are um, one, two, three, or four experts in each of the horticulture areas. So there's a turf grass person, there's a vegetable person, there's a, a disease person, and um, a host. So, and the host will get to call in questions or written in or emailed in questions and then ask each of the panel participants that question. So the question might be, I have um, this uh, strange looking, these strange looking spots on my crab apple tree. And they'll send a photo with it or they'll send an actual sample. So uh, Kim will kind of pat, push that over to the pathologist and they'll, and they'll say, you know, whatever. They'll say it's, what, you know, whatever the disease is, I'll look at those photos, I'll look at that sample and identify, oh, this is classic symptoms of apple scab. And then they'll go through the, the disease cycle and explain what you can and can't do. And, right. All right, we do have one more question and uh, your opinion on a product, M-A-L-O-R-G-A-M-I-T-E, Mal? Or yeah, so that's a product. Yeah, Melorganite, uh, Millorganite is a, a fertilizer product that's probably been around for 50 years. Um, what it is, is um, composted uh, sewage sludge, basically, from the city of Milwaukee. And um, at first there were, um, it was a great product, and then there were concerns about it having some heavy metals in it, like cadmium and lead. And so then they kind of stopped production of that for a while. But I would say overall, I haven't heard anything bad about it lately, at least in my circle. Um, it's a good slow release fertilizer. Um, I would not use it in a vegetable garden. Uh, even if it doesn't have the heavy metals in it, it's just not worth the risk. But I haven't heard anything about it, whether it's, you know, I haven't heard anything lately, about whether we're currently re recommending it. But Carol, that's something, if you get that person's email, we can follow up. Um, why don't we do that that way? I'd, I'd kind of like to be able to, uh, uh, you know, help people be happy to respond to them via email. So person iPhone, if you want to send that to Caitlin, your email, and Caitlin and I can get a hold of John and let him be able to follow up with you. 